Okay, so let us just continue. So if you look uh, at the specific case that we just uh, did, right, and compare the two uh, programs, it's easy to see the following, that given your initial linear programming problem, the objective for the dual problem is obtained as a linear combination of the bounds, right? Because remember, we were looking for linear combination of the bounds that will result is in as tight bound for the original objective as possible. So B's here in the original problem become the coefficients in the objective of the dual. And vice versa, the coefficients of the um, original problem become bounds in the dual problem, right? Because we always want to make sure that the linear combination of these new parameters y exceeds or is or equal to cj so that, uh, uh, the, so that you can use uh, this objective to, uh, to um, estimate, to bound the objective, the original objective, right? Uh, so again, the coefficients in the original objective, the, they become the, cons the bounds for the constraints, and the bounds for the constraints in the original problem uh, become the coefficients of the dual objective, right? So the primal problem is, say, maximize the objective subject to these constraints, uh, while the dual becomes minimize the a dual objective, right, uh, subject to the constraints, and it's easy to see, right, because here the summation was with respect to J, second variable, right, of the matrix, and here the summation is over the first um, variable of the matrix, right? So the, this matrix, uh, this matrix for the dual is simply the transposed matrix of the primal problem, right? Because instead of summing with respect to J's, we sum with respect to I's, right? And we have this, uh, additional uh, constraints that all the variables have to be uh, positive. Um, so, and now it's easy to see that in this way we achieve uh, our, what, what we wanted, namely, that the linear combination of the constraints will be an upper bound for our objective, and this is what this simple theorem uh, says, right, that uh, the, um, uh, the objective of the primal problem is uh, uh, majorized by the objective of the dual problem, of course, providing that the first problem was to maximize, uh, then dual will be to minimize. If it was vice versa, uh, minimize and then maximize, then of course the inequalities here will also flip around, right? Uh, will, this inequality will switch to the opposite direction. And that's trivial to see, right? Because uh, you see, by the, the constraints, uh, each CJ, right? The, this is the constraints from the dual. Each CJ is smaller or equal than this expression, right? Because this is the linear combination of the new variables and we always choose it so that it dominates the corresponding coefficient in the objective, right? So we have this inequality. Then we simply switch the order of summation, right? 
we take out the first sum and put inside the second sum, and we exchange the roles of y and x, right? If you multiply this by xj and then change the order of summation, you get this. But notice this is precisely uh, the constraints for the uh, primal problem, and we know that they are smaller or equal than the corresponding bounds. Uh, however, this is precisely the objective of the dual problem. So in short, the, in this type right, of a problem that asks you um, to uh, maximize uh, an objective, right, um, the dual of the, um, uh, the dual will always majorize um, the primal objective, right? And as I said, the simplex and in general LP solver compute both, um, uh, both uh, values of both the dual and primal and stop when this in fact becomes equal to that because of this inequality, right, once you, because this is always true, this is always smaller than the dual uh, ob um, objective. So if you find x's and uh, a fortiori y's that, so that this linear combination becomes precisely equal to that combination, this means, of course, that this is maximized and this is minimized, right? Because this is always smaller or equal than that for any feasible uh, variables, uh, uh, for any variables that satisfy uh, the primal object, uh, sorry, the primal constraints here and any variables that satisfy the dual um, constraints here Right, if, it, if you ever reach that this is equal to that, well, this can be only uh, when the left-hand side is maximized and the right-hand side is minimized because we know that all the values of the primal objective are smaller than any other values of the dual objective, uh, just requiring uh, that both values come from, a, from feasible solutions, namely solutions that satisfy the constraints. And this is precisely the situation that we had with max flow mid cut theorem, namely we had the situation that uh, all the flows are smaller or equal than, so any flow, legitimate flow, is smaller or equal than any cut Right? So if you find a flow that is equal to a cut, then this must be a max flow and the cut must be the minimal one because of these uh, uh, inequalities. So um, you can see in the lecture notes that I will put on the web uh, after the class uh, how simplex operates and it's really good to know. But what's most important here, it's okay if you want to ignore the details of uh, the simplex because it has been um, implemented in an extremely optimal way by many of the software packages, some of them free, some of them quite expensive. So it's not a good idea to code your own linear programming problem because um, the solutions from the, you know, the implementations in the software packages have been tremendously uh, optimized using all sorts of heuristic uh, tricks. Uh, but it's important just to know how to translate a practical problem uh, in, uh, into a linear programming problem. For example, you will get as an exercise uh, to formulate a portfolio optimization problem as a linear problem and then you simply plug it into a, a, a 
software package that solves it to get the solution. So it's important what I want you to kind of get out of this is just to understand how a, a practical problem can be uh, reduced to a linear programming problem. Okay, so now we want to show that uh, this situation, this kind of seeming um, analogy between max flow and mean cut is not actually an analogy, but it's verbatim true that in fact uh, uh, max flow mean cut problem is reducible to a linear programming problem. Right? So assume that we are given a flow network G and that the capacities of the edges are given as kappa ij. So kappa ij is the capacity of the link between vertex i and vertex j. And the max flow problem seeks to maximize the total flow uh, through the network either uh, the total flow leaving source, which would be this expression, or equivalently, the total flow arriving to the sink, right? So <clears throat> what are the constraints? Of, well, any flow has to be such, first of all, so that the flow between vertices i and j cannot exceed the capacity of the link between um, vertices i and j. Yeah? So every flow has to be smaller than the capacity uh, through, of that pipe. <coughs> then, as we mentioned, um, the flow conservation property says that if you exclude the sink and the source, then for any other internal vertex of the flow network, whatever comes into uh, a node, v, uh, into jade, jade node, right? Uh, so all flows that come from all other vertices i uh, that have connection, that have pipes to vertex j, must be precisely equal to, the, to all flows that leave vertex j going to other vertices k, right? So this is the flow conservation. And of course, flow cannot be negative um, in the original flow network, not in the residual um, uh, flow network. But uh, well, actually there, of course, we also have uh, <coughs> only positive because we change the direction. So um, all the flows are non-negative numbers. And just as before, this looks as a, obviously is a linear programming problem because you want to maximize this objective subject to these constraints. Well, we want to simplify this by turning this problem into canonical form, which means we want to get rid of this equality and replace it by inequality. And the simplest way would be to simply have inequality this direction and then minus inequality in opposite direction. <coughs> but it turns out we can save one of the two inequalities by doing a simple trick. <coughs> Namely, we make the flow circular. We take a pipe of infinite capacity and uh, turn it from the sink to the source. <coughs> so this makes the flow uh, circular. <coughs> and again, the task is, <coughs> excuse me, the task is to maximize the flow. Why is this good? Well, because now uh, objective can be replaced by a single variable which is just the flow through this uh, pipe. So we have uh, the following uh, um, is the case. The objective is to maximize the flow through this pipe, right? 
subject to the constraints, and now we simply drop inequality and replace it, sorry, drop equality and replace it by inequality. But because of the fact that the flow is circular, you see, if in the graph, if you had at some point, say, the total flow coming in being uh, strictly larger than the flow going out, because the flow is circular, eventually you will get that uh, uh, a constraints of this type of inequality will be violated because uh, whatever is outgoing flow here, it will become an incoming flow. And so if the inequality in opposite direction was violated, uh, eventually the equality in this direction will be also violated because the flow is circular. Of course, this requires a precise argument, but uh, it's intuitively quite opposite. You cannot have uh, more flow coming here than going out because if outgoing flow is smaller, eventually it will become incoming flow and will violate uh, uh, this constraint. So now, what do we do? We form the dual problem. How do we fo form dual problem? We form dual problem by multiplying both sides of these inequalities by some new variables, right? And then sum, uh, total, sum up the inequalities. So let's multiply the first inequality uh, by dijs, right? So dijs are new variables. So in order to get, you remember how we got the dual problem. You multiply each inequality with new variables and sum up. Uh, because here we have two variables, i and j, we need also two variables to index uh, uh, each of these inequalities, right? Here we have only one free variable, namely j, so we can multiply both sides by pj, and because pj will be positive, uh, on the right-hand side you get zero times pj, which is just pj with the same uh, direction of uh, inequality. Okay, so now, um, notice though, that there are two special cases, right? The uh, special case of the incoming flow, so let me, the one special case is at the sink, right? Because you have a, a sum of incoming flows and single outgoing flow, and the other is the source in which you have single incoming uh, flow and multiple outgoing uh, flows. So there are two special cases uh, in which uh, uh, one of the two inequalities is replaced by a single FTS, right, rather than sum. So uh, that uh, will be, um, uh, that will be, okay, we will see this a little bit later. Uh, let's look at the objective. The objective is, uh, remember the picture, instead of looking at summing up incoming flows here to maximize, we simply maximize the flow through uh, this additional pipe. So you can multiply by zero all the flows and by one the flow through TS, so the objective that you are trying to maximize is extremely simple, it's just variable FTS. And as you will see later with uh, some other examples, this is actually quite common. It happens uh, uh, quite frequently in uh, problems as we will see. Okay, so as I mentioned, we multiply first set of inequalities by dijs and the second set by pijs. And these are the two special cases, right, when 
you have, uh, this would be um, the flow from the uh, sink uh, to the source, right? So there is no sum, there is a single pipe from uh, sink to the source. And the, uh, similarly, <coughs> when uh, this uh, corresponds to the uh, source, uh, then you have single inflow, right, through the big pipe, right, minus all the outgoing um, flows from the source. And now we simply sum up all the inequalities that we have, and uh, uh, we move, so what will we have? Um, minus pi comes from this side, right, pj's come from this side, and uh, uh, we factor out uh, uh, fij, uh, then we have the two special ones, which is this minus this, and we factor out uh, fts, and we get just uh, uh, ps minus uh, pt, and on the right you get this uh, sum because these are all zeros, right? On the right, you get some of all of these, right? So this will be our objective. So we want to minimize this in order to get as tight bound to the original, uh, uh, to the original objective. So remember, so what does the dual then look like? Remember, all the coefficients of the primal problem become the bounds for the dual problem, and the only place where one appears is uh, for this flow FTS, right, with the corresponding side PS minus PT. So we get that this is bigger than one, and all of these, right, have to be bigger than the corresponding uh, uh, coefficient, which will be just uh, bigger than uh, zero, right? Because we have dij minus pij, and all the coefficients uh, on the objective are zero, so all of these have to be bigger than zero, except for the one that corresponds to uh, FTS we get is bigger, that it has to be bigger or equal than one. So this is our dual. Now, note an important feature here that um, all coefficients in these constraints are either plus one or minus one, right? And every variable appears positive only once and negative, um, so for every vertex, right, uh, we will have one, uh, we will have positive coefficients for incoming and negative for um, outgoing flows. So the simplex algorithm, and this is very, very specific case, it can be shown that for this type of inequalities, as simplex walks along the vertices uh, uh, determined by the, uh, the constraints, uh, it keeps always the values of dij's and uh, pj's always either plus or minus one. Um, so you can take this for granted, otherwise you can look at the lecture notes. So at the end, the solution, optimal solution, will also have dij's uh, either plus one or minus one as well as pij's. And we have to minimize this, right, this expression. Well, clearly, in order to minimize this, we want dij to be as often zero as possible, right? Because dij the solutions will be always zero and one. If you are minimizing this, of course, you are simply adding capacities of the pipes between, uh, of the edge ij. 
you are adding them up because this is either zero or one. So you want to add as few of them as possible. So you want to make dij zero whenever possible. When can you not make this equal to zero? The only situation is if pj was assigned value zero and pi was assigned value one because then you have minus one here and you need one here to cancel out to get zero, right? So in the minima, minimization of this, uh, dij will be uh, different from zero only if pj is assigned value zero and pi is assigned value one. And notice here, for this to be bigger or equal to one, uh, when will this happen? You only have to preclude that uh, pt is uh, um, uh, one and uh, um, ps is zero. So in order for this to uh, be uh, true, you have to make sure that uh, PS is one and PT is equal to zero. But what does this mean? Notice DIJs are capacities of the links and you can essentially you take DIJ with value one only if PI that corresponds to a vertex, right? Is assigned to one um, And um, so, so what does this uh, now mean? That uh, um, actually I am messing it up here. The values for the solution should be zero and one. Let me double check this. But the idea is now uh, the following. So. As I said, this will precisely correspond to the minimal cut because the assignments of PI, yeah, yeah, of course, it's not, uh, um, the variables are either zero and one, sorry, so this should be the coefficients are, the coefficients here are one or minus one, but the values of all the variables are either zero or, or one, right? So, uh, if you consider all vertices that are assigned value one as one set and all vertices assign pj as the other set, then you will be taking only pipes that are across the cut between those pi's that are assigned value one and those that are assigned value um, zero. So simply consider all the vertices with pi assigned to one and all the, uh, as one set, all the vertices with pj assigned value zero as the other set. And then minimizing this is essentially the minimizing the cut uh, that uh, is, are the vertices, that are the edges that go across right, uh, these two sets, once when pi is assigned to value one and pj assigned to value uh, zero. So in fact, uh, the feasible solution uh, is uh, um, precisely the one that corresponds to the uh, minimal cut. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, uh, it just happens to be that the dual variables always stay either zero or one, but this is in general uh, not the case. And uh, when, as I mentioned, if we impose an additional constraint that all the variables must take integer values, uh, then this becomes an integer linear problem and the problem is intractable because in general um, the solution for integer linear programming is NP-hard uh, and uh, 
we actually did this before because I changed the order of topics so that uh, um, we know why uh, integer LP problems are not solvable by a polynomial time algorithm. Okay, so the, what I want you to get from linear programming and that uh, you, might be, you might have a problem on the final is uh, concentrate how to uh, convert practical problems into linear programs and in what shape the problem has to be, how, would, how you would get them first the inequalities and then from these inequalities you read out the matrix A so that uh, you know how to put a problem in uh, um, a form that uh, the software packages expect to see. And this happens if you will do any work in finance or in logistics, you are guaranteed that you will have uh, to solve uh, linear programming problems. Uh, so it's really important to know how to translate problems from uh, just uh, plain English to uh, this matrix uh, uh, shape because this is what the packages uh, require you uh, to provide. Okay, so that's all that we are going to cover in this course. Uh, what we are going to do from now on, uh, we are going to uh, solve problems uh, starting with dynamic programming, okay? And uh, I get a lot of questions how to prepare for the final, okay? So we will go through a large number of examples. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot afford the tutorials for this class, so in lieu of tutorials, uh, the remaining time we will go carefully through um, a whole bunch of problems that will be on the web later this afternoon, and please try to uh, solve as many of them as possible during this week uh, so that when you see the solutions uh, next week you can appreciate uh, what is uh, uh, what it takes. Let me just turn on the lights for the blackboard. So the way how we are going to do it, we are not done, we have plenty of time. Um, the way how we are going to do it, uh, not, we are not just going to solve a problem. We are going to see what kind of logic was employed and uh, how the proper recursion was found, right? So we will analyze the solutions so that you have a good feeling how to approach an unknown problem, right? What are the steps or the components in solving these problems, especially the dynamic programming uh, problems? So let's, let me just get the lighting. So, so what are the, the steps um, in dynamic programming, right? The crux of dynamic programming is that... Uh, off. Sorry? Off. Oh my, oh, that must be... Oh. Yeah, the system is starting up, so let's just wait a little bit. Uh, Okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Okay, so 
Okay. So, <clears throat> first, you have to um, correctly define uh, sub problems, and you have to order the sub problems so that you know in which order you have to solve, you can solve them by recursion. Right, so the first trick is uh, uh, um, find sub problems um, and then order them um, order some problems to uh, allow recursion, right? And then uh, find a proper recursion. Um, now, <clears throat> When it comes to finding subproblems, in most of the cases, uh, not in all, but in a lot of cases, this will involve that you generalize the problem. So rather than just solving the original uh, problem uh, by varying the size, very often, you will have to do this by generalizing the problem appropriately. Why do you generalize the problem? So that you can find a simple recursive step, right? So now, how do you order the subproblems? You have to order subproblems in such a way that the construction of what you are looking for can be achieved from previous, uh, from uh, sub-problems that precede that sub-problem in your ordering. So you have to make sure that if you, when you order sub-problem, the ordering will not cause you to miss uh, the, the uh, optimal solution, right? So let's start. <coughs> with a simple example. So assume that you have an array, right, that uh, contains both positive and negative integers. And uh, the size of the array is n, okay? And uh, here you have either positive or negative integers. Uh, so the task is uh, find i and j such that the sum of elements k that are between uh, i and j is maximal. So you want to find contiguous subarray between cell i and cell j so that the sum is as large as possible. So what would be a good candidates for subproblems? What would be, what, what will be the collection of uh, problems that we will be recursively solving? Now clearly, and the algorithm has to run in time, sorry about that, O of N. Because otherwise, if you are allowed quadratic algorithm, you can simply compute the sum 
uh, of all uh, um, segments with endpoints i and j and um, uh, solve the problem. But we have to do it in linear time. What would be a good sub-problem to solve? You see, uh, there is one trick. Sub-problems have to be chosen so that they allow as simple as possible recursion. So the, the following is a good choice. So sub-problem. Uh, let's call it PM is uh, uh, find um, K uh, such that the sum when all uh, uh, say P goes between K and M of AM is, uh, sorry, thank you, AP is uh, uh, as large as possible right um, so notice here we assume that the very last so in that picture We are looking, so the solution of subproblem, so the k subproblem, this is LK, is to find, uh, oh sorry, not k, this is M. So is to find k so that this sum is maximal, so the stretch has to contain the last cell M. Right? We are not saying find the stretch in the array between 1 and m so that the sum is maximal. So we are not allowing solutions. Um, I did not say here find k and k prime so that the sum between k and k prime, which are both smaller than m, so we are not looking for this to be maximal. We insist that the last cell has to be taken. Right? So we are considering only these stretches. So assume now that we solved the problem for all indices up to m. How would you solve the problem with index m plus 1? So how would you solve the problem P M plus 1? Very good. Notice now, because we assume that the last cell is contained, right? We are not, you see, this would be a bad uh, example. Sub-problem PM. Find uh, K and L such that uh, K and L is less than or equal to M, so that the sum of uh, P between K and L of AM is maximal. Right? We are not trying to find the contiguous segment that is contained within first M element that is maximal, but we require that the very last cell is taken. Right? We look only in stretches. Why is this so? Well, if you had a situation like this, right? If this was your K, and here where Sorry, this is your uh, M. And here you get the situation 
that K and L, which are optimal solutions, were these. If I increase now M to M plus one, it would be hard to recurse because both ends are here, so you don't know how maybe, right, whether something here will be better than that. But notice if you do require that the last cell is contained, now the recursion is trivial. You simply consider two cases. You look for optimal solution for M when this is as large as possible. If this sum is positive, what is the solution for M plus one? Just concatenate the last cell. Because if this was as large as possible, clearly adding one extra cell will result in as large as possible. Why? Well, if it was, if there was something better, you consider truncation up to M, it would be better than this, which is impossible, right? Cut and paste algorithm uh, argument. If this is negative, what is optimal solution for M plus one? Hmm? If the string, if you have to contain this guy, what is the optimal value that you can get? It's just this singleton. You start anew from here, right? So you see, this is a common theme in dynamic programming, right? Now, why I do not miss any optimal solutions? One, I solve all these problems. I simply pick one with the largest score. Why haven't I lost any solutions? Well, any solution, that optimal solution, has to have one element as the last. And thus, our algorithm would have found it when solving for this element. So that's a very, very common theme. You restrict the space of solutions in such a way that recursion is simple, but you don't lose uh, uh, possibly the optimal solution. So this is how we are going to do it tomorrow and uh, in the, all of the remaining time. We will do problems, uh, but not just showing the solutions. We will try to, uh, dis to find the logic behind uh, so that you can solve unknown problems. So I'll see you tomorrow.